Good evening. John Quincy Adams is one of four New England characters portrayed by actor, historian Jim Cook. In a spirit unconquerable, we look at the last decade of this man's remarkable life. It was a life shaped by the demands of his father, John Adams, and his mother, the indomitable Abigail Adams. It provides a shining example of what a man can do as he nears the end of his life, if he is determined to do something. Believe my last portrait. <laughs> The more his effort is like, the less he pleases. He has stepped away, but will return shortly. Was I napping? I did not see you enter. Yes, I have sat too many daubers. I cannot believe more will follow him. Shades lately taken of me could serve to frighten the crows from my corn at Quincy. Is this the last time that a counterfeit presentment of me will be made in this world? Likenesses enough of my face and form will be left to survive me. I have sat to 16 portrait painters, five sculptors, and one medalist. Several have painted me twice. There are engraved copies and copies of the engravings. My face was copied in my 16th year and in my 70th. They show what I am and what I was. Our artist friend likes this light. He says he must capture it. Where is he now? gone to use the necessary. He said he might invite friends in to watch his work. My first impulse was to deny him and you that dubious pleasure. Yet people watch my work at Washington. The galleries are filled with my friends and enemies. Hm. The artist says that uh, we are partners in this. It is a collaboration between the subject and the artist. Sleep has too often been my contribution. He thinks if I have auditors to attend my remarks, it will induce wakefulness. Yet at the same time, he assures me that I may remain silent. He knows that is something I cannot do. <sighs> like my father before me, I served but one term as president. I left the president's house in March of 1829, making way for Andrew Jackson. All my hopes for the long continuance of this union are extinct. My system of administration was to make the national domain the inexhaustible fund for unceasing public improvements. It has failed. Abandoned by Henry Clay, given up by Calhoun, and deserted by Daniel Webster. I retired to my farm, Peacefield, at Quincy, thinking now. Now I will devote myself to my family and to the biography of my father. Ah, but then, against the strong wishes of family and friends, I return to Washington to take seat number 203 in the House of Representatives. <clears throat> when Henry Clay saw me at my desk, he asked, well, Adams, how does it feel to be a boy again? <laughs> My remarks today will lack all coherence if there is any uh, unifying principle behind them. It has yet to reveal itself. Well, perhaps one will be discovered. What? I will read to you will be abstracted from my journals and with some exceptions, I have selected entries in proximity to my birthday. July 11, 1836. With praise and power to God and a solemn sense of my earthly condition and hopes of a better world to come, 
I enter upon the 70th year of my pilgrimage. In my reading, I shall look up from time to time to impart an air of spontaneity. I have sat to many artists, they had only but to ask. For the sculptor Hiram Powers, I wrote this verse. Sculptor, thy hand has molded into form the haggard features of a toil-worn face. And whosoever views thy work shall trace an age of sorrow and a life of storm. And canst thou mold the heart, for that is warm, glowing with tenderness for all its race, instinct with all the sympathies that grace the pure and artless bosoms where they swarm. Artist, may fortune smile upon thy hand. Go forth and rival Greece's art sublime. Return and bid the statesmen of thy land live in thy marble through all after time. Oh, snatch the fire from heaven Prometheus stole, and give the lifeless block a breathing soul. Hmm. Abolitionists constantly urge me to indiscreet actions, actions which could uh, ruin me and uh, weaken their cause. My own family, on the other hand, my good wife, Louisa Catherine, and my one son, Charles Francis, and other dependent relations exercise all the influence that they possess to restrain and divert me from any and all connection with the abolitionists. However, as an elected representative, I am required to present abolitionist petitions from Massachusetts and other states. One day, <clears throat> I presented a petition from nine ladies of Fredericksburg, Virginia. Now, I was not certain that this petition was genuine. It prayed for the ending of the slave trade in our capital city. Now, if the petition was not genuine, I would not present it, nor would I name the women, the ladies whose signatures appeared thereon. Well, James Patton from uh, Richmond, Virginia, sat to my left. He had been raised in Fredericksburg, and he said that he was sure that no ladies from Fredericksburg ever signed any such petition. Upon examination, he recognized the name of one of the signers. It is not the name of a lady. It is the name of a free mulatta woman of the worst fame and reputation. He further assumed that the eight other signers were equally infamous. The gentleman from Virginia says he knows these women and that they are infamous. How does the gentleman know it? Mr. Patton hastened to assure the house that he did not know the women personally. I heard from others that the character of one of them was notoriously bad. I am glad the gentleman now disclaims any knowledge of these women, because if he had not dis denied that knowledge, I might have asked who it was that made these women infamous. I have heard that among the colored population, there are many who bear the image of their masters. So if they were infamous, it was not their color that made him so, it was their masters. Each year as the house adopted uh, new rules, I unceasingly endeavored to change that rule which stated, Congress will not receive petitions touching upon slavery because one, Congress has no right to interfere with slavery in any state, two, Congress ought not to interfere with slavery in the District of Columbia. And three, the agitation of the question of slavery is disquieting. So, 
All petitions touching upon slavery shall be laid upon the table and no further action whatever shall be had thereon. The resolutions were passed and became known as the gag rule. I would fight this rule for eight years. <laughs> July 10, 1838, about sunrise, I rode to the Potomac to my old bathing place beneath the bluff near the bridge where I bathed and swam about a quarter of an hour. It was my first river bath this season, and it seemed to give me new life. There were a number of other bathers, all young men except myself. The day after tomorrow, I shall be. 73. Boston, September 27, 1842. Today I visited a Daguerrean gallery to have my photograph taken. They took me to the top of a house where a, a round house had been erected. It had windows like a greenhouse uh, with a door opening to the sun. I took a seat at the corner of a settee so that the light came obliquely on the side of my face. There was a small telescope directly in front of me, and at a corresponding angle on the other side, a mirror. A tin or metallic plate was in, fitted into the telescope, and on that metallic plate the photographic impression is made. Not more than two minutes were required for each impression, during which I was required to keep my head immovable, looking steady at one object. They kept me there an hour and a half and took seven or eight impressions, all of them bad. An exposition of sleep came over me, and I found it utterly impossible to keep my eyes open for two minutes together. I dozed and the picture was asleep. I give it up in despair. How the impression is taken or comes upon the plate is utterly inconceivable to me. Well, in the year following my father's death, I wrote this poem for his birthday on October 30, 1827. Day of my father's birth, I hail thee yet. What? Though his body molders in the grave, yet shall not death the immortal soul enslave. The sun is not extinct, the orb has set. And where on earth's wide ball shall man be met while time doth run but from thy spirit brave? Shall dare to grasp the boon his maker gave and spurn the terrors of a tyrant's threat.